There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I am slowly churning out these book hauls because I have been spending all of the extra spending money I had during the two or three months of the pandemic lockdown because I wasn't going out, I wasn't using public transportation, I was never going to restaurants, I had all this extra spending money and I spent it all on books. So this is but one small installment on hauling them all for your viewing pleasure. So let's get started. There were three books that were published this spring by the British Library. There's a fourth one coming out for some reason a little bit later. So it's the British Library Women Writers Series, and most of these novels were originally published in the 30s. Hello! It's my period! It's my people! The first one is by Molly Panter Downs, My Husband Simon. Now, cousin of Always Doing and I did a buddy read of another Molly Panter Downs novella. One Fine Day, 1947, and this one was published a bit earlier, 1931, and I have it now. I quite enjoyed One Fine Day. I'm hoping I might like this even better. I'll put a link to the discussion the video that Cousin and I made about that, and it's about a woman who's a sophisticated novelist who marries a man named Simon. The first sentence of the novel is set in New York in the autumn of 1930. I sometimes wonder, looking back at everything with the experience that four years ought to have brought, whether I would make up my mind quite so precipitously to marry Simon Quinn if I met him for the first time today. It's a good question, isn't it? The next one in this same British Library Women Writers series that I picked up is Chatterton Square by E. H. Young. They're very attractive and they're all bump nice, uh, what do you call it? Uh, raised covers like the design is you can feel it with your fingers it's just um, they're lovely additions E.H. Young I've heard of her this was originally published in 1947 it's a sharp and insightful observation of marriage and families don't need to know anything more than that it was her final novel just to remind you that I only share opening sentences or paragraphs if they have some kind of a standalone vitality and just because they don't this one doesn't uh, that doesn't make me think that the book isn't going to be any good, but let's, let's move on. Next is The Tree of Heaven by Mae Sinclair. Isn't that gorgeous? And again, it's really bumpy. It's beautiful. <laughs> Originally published 1917. Mae Sinclair was a popular British writer and active suffragette. Oh, I wonder if I read about her in the biography of the Pankhurst that I read. That name does ring a bell, actually. Interesting! And now for something completely different. Rickshaw Boy by La Shea. And I first heard about this novel, if I'm not mistaken, on Matthew Sharapa's channel back in the day. And it's translated from the Japanese by Howard Goldblatt. First published in China in 1937, and it is the story of a rickshaw boy, a rickshaw puller, I guess they called them in English. And Lao She is one of the most widely read popular Chinese novelists of the first half of the 20th century. And this is one that I probably still have in a box somewhere in Canada. I don't remember that series of boxes that I've been unboxing. I filmed them all in last August. And I have only have one more video to show you from that series. And I can't remember if this was in one of them, but I bought a copy because I could get it fairly cheap here in Japan to reread it. Neil Bartlett's gay novel from the 1990s. He's a British gay novelist and playwright. Ready to catch him should he fall. At the time, I thought it was one of the best gay novels I'd ever read. I have no idea what I think of it now, but I am planning to reread it. Published in 1990, so I came out in 1986. So I read this at a fairly formative period of my gay life. In 1990, I would have been 24 years old. And I remember, I don't know if I read it in 1990, but shortly thereafter. And I thought at the time a really realistic portrait of a gay relationship. Some parts of that relationship were a little disturbing to me, but challenging in a good way to read about. I'm really looking forward to reading it again. It's the opening paragraph, I actually remember it fairly well. This is a picture which I took of him myself. He was so beautiful in those days. Listen to me, those days. Talking like it was all ancient history. It's just that at the time it all seemed so beautiful and important. It was like some kind of historical event. History on legs, we used to say. A significant pair of legs, an important stomach, legendary, a classic of the genre. Historic. Well, it was true. All of it. 
And because it was very affordable, I also picked up a copy of The Evenings by Gerard Reeve. I believe this is he's Dutch, isn't he? Yes, Gerard Reeve, who died in 2006, aged about 70-something. He was considered one of Holland's greatest post-war novelists. Oh, and he was the first openly gay writer in the country's history. I don't think I even... I wonder if this is a gay novel. I remember hearing about it on Litzy about five years ago, and I always kind of kept it in mind and could get a, a really cheap copy online. According to the synopsis, it doesn't say if the protagonist is gay, but I've heard good things about it. Translated from the Dutch by Sam Garrett. It's quite an attractive hardcover. But I didn't ever, I didn't remember, I don't usually forget if an author's gay, so I don't think I ever actually knew that Gerard Reeve was gay. I shall check it out. And now I'm looking at this next book, and it almost feels like I'm looking at it for the first time, but I vaguely remember buying it. I have no idea why. The title and the author are completely unknown to me, so it must have been on deeply discounted price online. It's called The River by Rafael Sanchez Forlosio. Translated from the Spanish by Margaret Jewel Costa. I've read other books she has translated. It's considered one of the most important and successful Spanish novels of the last 50 years. It won some National Spanish Literary Prize in 1956, and it's set during the Spanish Civil War. Hey, look at that cover. The opening sentence is quite long and looks quite intriguing, but there's so many words that I don't know how to pronounce that uh, it would take me half an hour to do the research to, to read it passably. Looking forward to giving this chunky Spanish novel a try. And I've got myself another Elizabeth Bowen novel, Friends and Relations. This one I'd never heard of. I've got the great cover photo. Where does it fit? I read and absolutely loved The Last September. And where does this fit in conjunction to that? The Last September was... Oh, this is her next novel. So The Last September was her second novel, if I'm reading this correctly. 1929. I'll put a link to my full review. And friends, this novel was 1931. Set during a soft English summer in the 1920s. All right. Her prose is sublime. <laughs> Opening sentence. It's very Bowenish. The morning of the Tilney Stuttered wedding, rain fell steadily from before daylight, veiling trees and garden, and darkening the canvas of the marquee that should have caught the earliest sun in happy augury. Oh my, okay. This is another gay novel that I've bought a second copy of because I never read the first one before I got rid of it. And that is Rolling the R's by R. Zamora Linmark, and I believe Filipino-American writer. This is a really wacky cover. I had a different edition that I disposed of before ever reading it, but uh, does it get any gayer than this, people? <laughs> that. <laughs> it was originally published in 1995, so I had that edition, and this is a reprint from about 2016 with a new afterword by the author. And it's set in a small 1970s community of Hawaii. A tour de force experiment in narrative, structure, pigeon, and perspective. And this is the special 20th anniversary edition. The, the characters are queer adolescents in Honolulu of various ethnic backgrounds. And I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, the author, Zamora Linmark, is Filipino-American. Finally, I have to get to this. This is a fairly new NYRB books book. Sal Bernardo by Graciliano Ramos who is one of Brazil's most famous novelists. This is translated from the Portuguese by Padma Viswanathan. I read his 1938 novel in English translation. It was not an NYRB book called Barren Lives, and it was really good. So that's why I wanted to read this one. It was newly published in the NYRB book series. Barren Lives was about dirt poor agrarian folk in Brazil, and this one seems to be similar. A field hand who becomes the master of the rundown estate called Sal Bernardo, where he had been a field hand and now he's the master. So that sounds pretty interesting. Another NYRB books book, My Friend by Emmanuel Bove, translated from the French by Janet Louth. I don't remember why I got it, but it is his first and most famous book. And it's about some solitary man in the streets of Paris in search of love and friendship supposed to be quite an endearing protagonist. If Bove died in 1945, aged not quite 50. His father was a Jewish emigre from Kiev and his mother was a Parisian chambermaid. 
Opening paragraph. When I wake up, my mouth is open. My teeth are furry. It would be better to brush them in the evening, but I am never brave enough. Tears have dried at the corners of my eyes. My shoulders do not hurt anymore. Some stiff hair covers my forehead. I spread my fingers and push it back. It is no good. Like the pages of a new book, it springs up and tumbles over my eyes again. Okay, well, that starts out quite invitingly. Now, this next one, I can't remember if it was Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventures who suggested it to me, or when she saw my tweet that I had added it to my TBR, she was very enthusiastic about it. I think it's the latter. Somebody else talked about it on Twitter, but I picked up The Garden of the Finzi Contini's by Giorgio Bassani in this attractive Everyman's Library edition, translated from the Italian by William Weaver. It's Bassani's acclaimed novel of unrequited love and the plight of Italian Jews on the brink of World War II, a classic of modern Italian literature. And I had never heard of it until I saw the tweet, and then Mel said, Oh, Sean, it's such a Sean book. I loved it. You have to read it. So now I have to read it. Opening paragraph. The tomb was big, massive, really imposing, a kind of half-ancient, half-oriental temple of the sort seen in the sets of Ida and Nabucco in vogue in our opera houses until a few years ago. In any other cemetery, the neighboring municipal cemetery included, a tomb of such pretensions would not have been the least amazing. Indeed, confused in the general array, it would have gone unremarked. But in ours, it was unique. And so, though it rose quite far from the entrance gate, at the end of an abandoned field where no one had been buried for more than half a century, it stood out. It was immediately noticeable. Okay, I want to keep reading. And the last one, and I'm a little bit unhappy because when it came in the mail, it was just ever so slightly bumped on the cover, top right corner, and more bumped on the bottom left corner. Yeah, but it's still fine, but I bought it because it's one of the most beautiful covers. <laughs> Tea Time for the Firefly by Shona Patel, and it's just bumped from being in the mail. This one is not bad. This one is a little bad, but it's, it's just covered up. It's not a gorgeous cover. It's a cover by Shona Patel. She is the daughter of an Assam tea planter. It's her debut novel. This was published in 2013. The female protagonist was raised to be educated and independent by her eccentric grandfather. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. I think I didn't just buy it for the cover. But look at that cover one more time. <laughs> Opening paragraph. My name is Lila, and I was born under an unlucky star. The time and place of my birth makes me a manglick. For a young girl growing up in India in the 1940s, this is bad news. The planet Mars is predominant in my Hindu horoscope, and this angry red planet makes people rebellious and militant by nature. Everyone knows I am astrologically doomed and fated never to marry. Marriages in our society are arranged by astrology, and nobody wants a warlike bride. Women are meant to be the needle that stitches families together, not the scissors that cut. Well, that is a fantastic opening paragraph. So that's one more stack, and there's still two more stacks to go, and books coming in all the time, but thank you very much for watching. <laughs> Thank you.